Hello and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. My name is Rory and if you've never been on this channel or seen this show before, what we do here is we read old folk tales and fairy tales. And in particular in the month of October we read old sort of weird fiction, horror, ghost stories, Victorian era kind of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> what we do on the channel in general on varietal literature is everything to do with stories. Uh, so Tuesday nights we I tell stories. On Wednesday nights, although it's not running at the moment, but we have a book club uh, that features Vancouver authors. It's more modern stuff. And then uh, on Thursday nights, we write stories together, if that interests you at all. Um, <clears throat> if any one of those three interests you. What we're doing tonight is... Uh, pardon me. Horror stories set in forests. <clears throat> now, I come from uh, British Columbia, so I live around a lot of thick old growth forests and uh, I definitely related to these stories quite a bit when I was reading through them and trying to pick them for this episode. Hopefully everyone can hear me just fine. Let me know if the audio is a little off at any point. But I'm going to read two stories for you tonight. One from uh, the very famous Algernon Blackwood and uh, one from a name that just currently slipped my mind. I'm very bad at names. You'll learn that if you haven't been here before. Um, I think it's... I know... It's a name I hadn't encountered before. Let me, let me see if I can bring it up here for myself. In case you haven't noticed, I'm uh, not a professional. <laughs> Just a person. Uh, the Dead Valley is by, let's find out. There we are. Ralph Adams Cram. Cram was the name I was trying to remember. Ralph Adams Cram. Uh, who I'd never heard of before uh, this week. So that is why it was news to me. So yeah, that's what we do for about an hour. Although I think we might go a little longer tonight. We read two stories. If you are not watching this live if you were watching this back later down in the description there will be little time stamps you can use to jump ahead to the beginning of each story if you want to watch it in a couple of parts or whatever else um <clears throat> the first one we're going to read is called the dead valley and it is a pretty they're both sort of more atmospheric than last week's uh which was a little more action and and horror uh, they're both, they're still definitely horror, but they're more atmospheric than normal. Um, <clears throat> or than last week. But uh, the first one is, is probably the most, like, horrifying. <laughs> the second one is more, like, creepy and weird. I wouldn't say it's not scary, but it's, it's, it's a lot more atmosphere, and I don't know why, but it really kind of stuck with me more. I read about six or seven stories this week, trying to pick a couple for the show, and uh, that one really stuck with me for whatever reason, so we'll read that one second. But The Dead Valley is the first one we're reading. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so yeah. Gia says, I love atmospheric. By the way, if you are watching live, feel free to join in the chat. I don't interact with it too much while the show is ongoing, but, um, or sorry, while I'm telling the story. But what I do is I check on it in between stories and we can discuss stuff a little bit if you want. Now, the first thing I have to do is get our atmosphere going. I do like my fireplace, but we're in a woods, which means... We need some wind. Let me know if that wind is too loud or if it's competing with me or anything like that. Um, I can adjust the volume accordingly. And... Let's do a little light rain. There we go. Yeah, let me know if at any point you're having trouble hearing me. I, c I can kill off some sounds or, or up them if you can't hear them. <clears throat> Our first story is from a collection called Black Spirits and White, A Book of Ghost Stories by Ralph Adams Cram. And the story is The Dead Valley.
I have a friend, Olaf Einresvard, a Swede by birth, who yet, by a reason of a strange, melancholy mischance of his early boyhood, has thrown his lot with that of the New World. It is a curious story of a headstrong boy and a proud and relentless family. The details do not matter here, but they are sufficient to weave, weave a web of romance around the tall, yellow-bearded man with the sad eyes and the voice that gives itself perfectly to plaintive little Swedish songs remembered out of childhood. In the winter evenings, we play chess together, he and I, and after some close, fierce battles has been fought, battle has been fought to a finish, usually with my own defeat, we fill our pipes again, and the Ironsvard tells me stories of the far, half-remembered days in the fatherland, before he went to sea, stories that grow very strange and incredible as the night deepens and the fire falls together, but stories that nevertheless I fully believe. One of them made a strong impression on me, so I set it down here, only regretting that I cannot reproduce the curiously perfect English and the delicate accent which to me increased the fascination of the tale. Yet as best as I can remember it, here it is. I never told you how Nils and I went over the hills to Hallsberg, and how we found the dead valley, did I? Well, this is the way it happened. I must have been about 12 years old, and Nils Soilberg, whose father's estate joined ours, was a few months younger. We were inseparable just at that time, and whatever we did, we did together. Once a week, it was market day in Engelholm, and Nils and I went always there to see the strange sights that the market gathered from all the surrounding country. <clears throat> One day, we quite lost our hearts for an old man from across the Elfborg had brought a little dog to sell. That seemed to us the most beautiful dog in all the world. He was a round, woolly puppy, so funny that Nils and I sat down on the ground and laughed with him until he came and played with us in so jolly a way that we felt there was only one really desirable thing in life. And that was the little dog of the old man from across the hills. But alas, he had not half, we had not half money enough wherewith to buy him. So we were forced to beg the old man to sell him before the next market day, promising that we would bring the money for him then. He gave us his word, and we ran home very fast and implored our mothers to give us money for the little dog. We got the money, and we could not wait for the next market day. Suppose the puppy should be sold. The thought frightened us so that we begged and implored that we might be allowed to go over the hills to Hallsburg, where the old man lived, and get the little dog ourselves. And at last they told us we might go. By starting early in the morning, we should reach Hallsburg by three o'clock, and it was arranged that we should stay there that night with Nils's aunt, and leaving by noon the next day, be home again by sunset. Well, soon after sunrise, we were on our way, and having received minute instructions as to just what we should do in all possible and impossible circumstances, and finally a repeated injunction that we should start for home at the same hour the next day so that we might get safely back before nightfall. For us, it was magnificent sport, and we started off with our rifles full of the sense of our very great importance. Yet the journey was simple enough, along a good road, across the big hills we knew so well, for Nils and I had shot over half the territory this side of the dividing ridge of the Elfborg. Back of Ingelholm lay a long valley which rose the low mountains, 
and we had to cross this and then follow the road along the side of the hills for three or four miles before a narrow path branched off to the left leading up through the pass nothing occurred of interest on the way over and when we reached Hallsburg in due season we found to our inexpressible joy that the little dog was not sold secured him and so went to the house of Nils' aunt to spend the night. Why we did not leave early the following day, I can't quite remember it. At all events, I know we stopped at a shooting range just outside of town where the most attractive pasteboard pigs were sliding slowly through painted foliage, serving as beautiful marks. The result was that we did not get fairly started for home until afternoon. And as we found ourselves at last pushing up the side of the mountain with the sun dangerously near their summits, I think we were a little scared at the prospect of the examination and possible punishment that awaited us when we got home at midnight. <clears throat> Therefore, we hurried as fast as possible up the mountainside while the blue dust closed in about us, and the light died in the purple sky. At first, we had talked hilariously, and the little dog had leaped ahead of us with the utmost joy. Latterly, however, a curious oppression came on us, and we did not speak or even whistle, while well, the dog fell behind, following us with hesitation in every muscle. We had passed through the foothills and the low spurs of the mountains, and were almost at the top of the main range when life seemed to go out of everything, leaving the world dead and so suddenly silent. The forest became so stagnant. Instinctively, we halted to listen. Perfect silence. The crushing silence of a deep forest at night. And more <clears throat> for always, even in the most impenetrable fastnesses of the wooded mountains, is the multitudinous murmur of little lives, awakened by the darkness. exaggerated and intensified by the stillness of the air and the great dark. But here and now the silence seemed unbroken even by the turn of a leaf, the movement of a twig, the note of night bird or insect. I could hear the blood beat through my veins and the crushing of grass under our feet as we advanced in hesitating steps sounded like the falling of trees. And the air was stagnant, dead. The atmosphere seemed to lie upon the body like the weight of sea on a diver who has ventured too far into its awful depths. What we usually call silence seems so only in relation to the din of ordinary experience. This was silence in the absolute. It crushed the mind while it intensified the senses, bringing down the awful weight of inextinguishable fear. I know that Nils and I stared towards each other in abject terror, listening to our quick, heavy breathing, 
that sounded to our acute senses like the fitful rush of waters. And the poor little dog we were leading justified our terror. The black oppression seemed to crush him even as it did us. He lay close on the ground, moaning feebly and dragging himself painfully and slowly closer to Nil's feet. I think this exhibition of utter animal fear was the last touch, and must inevitably have blasted our reason. Mine, anyway. But just then, as we stood quaking on the bounds of madness, came a sound so awful and so ghastly, <clears throat> so horrible, that it seemed to rouse from us the dead spell that was on us. In the depth of the silence came a cry, beginning as a low, sorrowful moan, rising to a tremulous shriek culminating in a yell that seemed to tear the night in its sunder and rend the world as by a cataclysm. So fearful was it that I could not believe it had actual existence. It passed previous experience, the powers of belief, and for a moment I thought it the result of my own animal terror, an hallucination born of tottering reason. A glance at Nils dispelled this thought in a flash. In the pale light of the high stars, he was the embodiment of all possible human fear, quaking with an ague, his jaw fallen, his tongue out, his eyes protruding like those of a hanged man. Without a word, we fled. The panic of fear giving us strength, and together the little dog caught close in Nil's arms, and we sped down the side of the cursed mountains. Anywhere, goal was of no account. We had but one impulse, to get away from that place. So under the black trees and the far white stars that flashed through the still leaves overhead, we leaped down the mountainside, regardless of path or landmark, straight through the tangled underbrush, across mountain streams, through fens and copses, anywhere so only that our course was downward. How long we ran thus, I have no idea, but by and by, the forest fell behind, and we found ourselves among the foothills, and fell exhausted on the dry, short grass, panting like tired dogs. It was lighter here in the open, and we presently looked around to see where we were, and how we were to strike out in order to find the path that would lead us home. We looked in vain for a familiar sound behind, sign. Behind us rose the great wall of black forest on the flank of the mountain. Before us lay the undulating mounds of low foothills, unbroken by trees or rocks, and beyond only the fall of black sky, bright with multitudinous stars that turned its velvet depth to a luminous gray. As I remember... We did not speak to each other even once. The terror was too heavy on us for that, but by and by we rose simultaneously and started out across the hills. Still, the same silence, the same dead, motionless air that was at once sultry and chilling, a heavy heat struck through with an icy chill that felt almost like the burning of frozen steel. Still carrying the helpless dog, Nils pressed on through the hills and I followed close behind. At last, in front of us rose a slope of moor touching the white stars, and we climbed it wearily, reaching the top, and found ourselves gazing down into a great, smooth valley filled halfway to the brim with what? As far as the eye could see stretched a level plain of ashy white, faintly phosphorescent. A sea of velvet fog 
that lay like motionless water, or rather like a floor of alabaster, so dense did it appear, so seemingly capable of sustaining weight. If it were possible, I think that sea of dead white mist struck even greater terror into my soul than the heavy silence or the deadly cry. So ominous was it, so utterly unreal, so phantasmal, so impossible as it lay there like a dead ocean under the steady stars, and yet through that mist we must go. There seemed no other way home, and shattered with abject fear, mad with one desire to get back, we started down the slope to where the sea of milky mist ceased, sharp and distinct around the stems of the rough grass. I put one foot into the ghostly fog, a chill as of death struck through me, stopping my heart, and I threw myself backwards on the slope. At that instant came again the shriek, close, close. Right in our ears. And far out across that damnable sea, I saw the cold fog lift like a water spout and toss itself high in writhing convolutions towards the sky. The stars began to grow dim as thick vapor swept across them. And in the growing dark, I saw a great watery moon lift itself slowly above the palpitating sea, vast and vague in the gathering mist. This was enough. We turned and fled among the margin of the white sea that throbbed now with fitful motion below us, rising and rising slowly and steadily, driving us higher and higher up the foothills. It was a race for life, that we knew. How we kept it up, I cannot understand, but we did, and at last we saw the white sea fall behind us as we staggered up the end of the valley and then down into a region that we knew, and so on into an old path. The last thing I remember was hearing a strange voice, that of Nils, but horribly changed, stammer brokenly. The, 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 the dog's dead. And then the whole world turned round twice, slowly and resisted, resistlessly, and consciousness went out with a crash. It was some three weeks later, as I remember, that I awoke in my own room and found my mother sitting beside the bed. I could not think very well at first, but as I grew strong again, vague flashes of recollection began to come to me. And little by little, the whole sequence of events of that awful night in the Dead Valley came back. All that I could gain from what was told me was that three weeks before, I'd been found in my own bed raging sick and then my illness grew faster grew fast into brain fever i tried to speak of the dread things that had happened to me but i saw at once that no one looked on them save as the hauntings of a dying frenzy and so i closed my mouth and kept my own counsel i must see nils however and so i asked for him my mother told me that he had also been ill with a strange fever but that he was now quite well again. Presently they brought him in, and when we were alone, I began to speak to him of the night on the mountain. I shall never forget the shock that struck me down on my pillow when the boy denied everything. Denied having gone with me, ever having heard the cry, having seen the valley or feeling the deadly chill of the ghostly fog, nothing would shake his determined ignorance. And in spite of myself, I was forced to admit that his denials came from no policy of concealment, but, well, from blank oblivion. My weakened brain was in turmoil. Was it all but the floating phantasm of delirium? Or had the horror of the real thing blotted Nil's mind into blankness so far as the events of the night in the Dead Valley were concerned? 
The latter explanation seemed to be the only one. Else, how explain the sudden illness, which in a night had struck us both down? But I said nothing more, either to Nils or to my own people. I waited with a growing determination that once well again, I would find that valley if it really existed. It was some weeks before I was really well enough to go, but finally, late in September, I chose a bright, warm, still day, the last smile of the dying summer, and started early in the morning along the path that led to Hallsberg. I was sure I knew where the trail struck off to the right, but down which we had come from the valley of the dead water. For a great tree grew by the Hallsberg path, the point where, with a sense of salvation, we had found the home road. And presently I saw it to the right, a little distance ahead. I think the bright sunlight and the clear air had worked as a tonic for me. For by the time I came to the foot of the great pine, I had quite lost faith in the verity of the vision that haunted me. Believing at last that it was indeed but the nightmare of madness, nevertheless I turned sharply to the right, at the base of the tree, into a narrow path that led through a dense thicket. As I did so, I tripped over something, a swarm of flies sung in the air around me, and looking down, oh, I saw the matted fleece, the poor little bones thrusting through of the dog we had bought in Hallsburg. Then my courage went out with a puff. And I knew it was all true. And now that I was frightened, pride and the desire for adventure was all that urged me on. And I pressed into the close thicket that barred my way. The path was hardly visible. Merely the worn road of some small beast, for though it showed in the crisp grass, the bushes above grew thick and hardly penetrable. The land rose slowly and the rising grew clearer until at last I came out on a great slope of hill unbroken by trees or shrubs. Very like my memory that rise of land we had topped in order that we might find the dead valley in the icy fog. I looked at the sun, it was bright and clear and all around insects were humming <clears throat> there we are in the autumn air and the birds were darting to and fro and Surely there was no danger, not until nightfall at least. So I began to whistle. And with a rush, mounted the last crest of the brown hill. And there lay the dead valley. A great oval basin, almost as smooth and regular as though made by man. On all sides the grass crept over the brink of the encircling hills, dusty green on the crests, then fading into ashy brown, and so to a deadly white, this last color forming a thin ring, running in a long line around the slope. And then, nothing. Bare, brown, hard earth glittering with grains of alkali, but otherwise dead and barren, not a tuft of grass, not a stick of brushwood, not even a stone, but only the vast expanse of beaten clay. In the midst of the basin, perhaps a mile and a half away, the level expanse was broken by a great dead tree, rising leafless and gaunt into the air without a moment's hesitation. I started down into the valley and made for this goal. Every particle of fear seemed to have left me, and even the valley itself did not look so terrifying. At all events, I was driven by an overwhelming curiosity, and there seemed to be but one thing in the world to do, to get to that tree. 
As I trudged along over the hard earth, I noticed that the multitudinous voices of birds and insects died away. No bee or butterfly hovered through the air. No insects leapt or crept over the earth. The very air itself was stagnant. As I drew near the skeleton tree, I noticed the glint of sunlight on a kind of white mound around its roots. And I wondered curiously. It was not until I had come close that I saw its true nature. All around the roots and barkless trunk was heaped a wilderness of little bones. Tiny skulls of rodents and of birds, thousands of them, rising above, about the dead tree and streaming off for several yards in all directions, until the dreadful pile ended in isolated skulls and scattered skeletons. Here and there, a larger bone appeared, the thigh of a sheep the hooves of a horse, and to one side, grinning slowly, a human skull. I stood quite still, staring with all my eyes, when suddenly the dense silence was broken by a faint, forlorn cry over my head. I looked up and saw a great falcon turning and sailing downward just over the tree, and a moment more she fell motionless on the bleaching bones. Horror struck me, and I rushed for home, my brain whirling, a strange numbness growing in me, and I ran steadily on and on. At last I glanced up. Where was the rise of the hill? I looked around wildly. Close before me was the dead tree with its pile of bones. I had circled it round and round, and the valley wall was a, still a mile and a half away. I stood dazed and frozen. The sun was sinking, the red and dull towards the line of hills. In the east, the dark was growing fast. Was there still time? Time! It was not that I wanted. It was will. My feet seemed clogged as in a nightmare, and I could hardly drag them over the barren earth. And then I felt that slow chill creeping through me, and I looked down out of the earth a Thin mist was rising, collecting in little pools that grew ever larger until they joined here and there in their currents, swirling slowly like thin blue smoke. The western hills halved the copper sun. When it was dark, I should hear that shriek again, and then I should die. I knew that with every remaining atom of will, I staggered towards the red west, through the writhing mist that crept clamily towards my ankles, retarding my steps. And as I fought my way off from the tree, the horror grew, until at last I thought I was going to die. The silence pursued me like Dumb ghosts, the still air held my breath, the hellish fog caught at my feet like cold hands. But I won, though not a moment too soon. As I crawled on my hands and knees up the brown slope, I heard, far away and high in the air, the cry that had already already had almost bereft me of reason. It was faint and vague, but unmistakable in its horrible intensity. I glanced behind, and the fog was dense and pallid, heaving undulously up the brown slope. The sky was gold under the setting sun, but below was the ashy gray of death. I stood for a moment on the brink of this sea of hell, and leaped down the slope. The sunset opened before me and the night closed behind me and as I crawled home, weak and tired, darkness shut down on the Dead Valley. And that is the Dead Valley 
from Black Spirits and White, Book of Ghost Stories. <clears throat> Just gonna get myself a drink of water. So, that means it is time for us to move on to our next reading. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, hopefully you guys like that one. I, uh... I, I understand that reading anything that involves the death of an animal is uh, always always a challenge. Uh, and I certainly uh, don't want to put people in that position to feel like, you know, they got... Like, I would put warnings out, but then it kind of robs it, right? Uh, Jess says, hey, I want more. <laughs> uh, so this one, next one is not particularly short. So I, I mean, it's not super long, but normally we do kind of a longer one and a short one. And the first one's a longer one. Uh, so we will be going a bit longer tonight. Again, if you're unable to stay, I mean, these go up on YouTube. They're in the Fireside Fairy Tales playlist. Uh, you guys can come back and catch it anytime if that goes too long for you. No need to worry about that. <clears throat> This one is on the more atmospheric side, as I said earlier. Um, a little more calm, a little less frenetic, a little more eerie. <coughs> Pardon me. I get this thing that when it rains... Um, I, uh, I cough a lot. I don't know if other people get that. I've heard it just is a result of sort of stuff settling in your lungs. I don't know. What, what, the other thing that makes me cough a lot, I don't know if other people get this, is, um, uh, um, laughing hard. But apparently that's actually quite common. Hard laughter is a trigger for coughing. All right. Well, no reason to waste time. This next story is from Eldernon Blackwood, who's a very, very famous uh, sort of Victorian era, I think he's Victorian anyways, um, ghost story writer. And it's from the collection called The Empty House and Other Ghost Stories. And the one we're going to be reading specifically is called The Wood of the Dead. One summer in my wanderings with a knapsack, I was at lun a luncheon in the room of a wayside inn in the West con western country when the door opened and there entered an old rustic who crossed close to my end of the table. Let's get that. Let's get a little luncheon going here. Sat himself down very quietly in the seat by the bow b window. We exchanged glances, or properly speaking, nods. For at the moment, I did not actually raise my eyes to his face. I was concerned, so concerned was I with the important business of satisfying an appetite gained by tramping 12 miles over a difficult country. The fine warm rain of seven o'clock, which had 
since risen in a kind of luminous mist over the treetops, now floated far overhead in a deep blue sky, and the day was settling down into a blaze of golden light. It was one of those days peculiar to Somerset and North Devon, when the orchards shine and the meadows seem to add radiance of their own. So brilliantly soft are the colorings of grass and foliage. The innkeeper's daughter, a little maiden with a small country loveliness, presently entered with a foaming pewter mug, inquired after my welfare, and went out again. Apparently she had not noticed the old man in the settle by the bow window. Nor had he, for his part, so much as once turned his head in our direction. <coughs> Under ordinary circumstances, I should probably have given no thought to this other occupant of the room, but the fact that it was supposed to be reserved for my private use, and the singular thing that he sat looking aimlessly out of the window, with no attempt to engage me in conversation, drew my eyes more than once somewhat curiously upon him. And I soon caught myself wondering why he sat there so silently, and always with averted head. He was, I saw, a rather bent old man in rustic dress, and the skin of his face was wrinkled like that of an apple. Corduroy trousers were caught up with a string below the knee, and he wore a sort of brown fustian jacket that was very much faded. His thin hand rested upon a stoutish stick. He wore no hat and carried none. And I noticed that his head covered with silvery hair, was finely shaped and gave the impression of something noble. Though rather piqued by his studied disregard of my presence, I came to the conclusion that he probably had something to do with the little hostel. I had a perfect right to use this room with freedom. So I finished my luncheon without breaking the silence and then took the settle opposite to smoke a pipe before going on my way. Through the open window came the scents of the blossoming fruit trees. The orchard was drenched in sunshine and the branches danced lazily in the breeze. The grass below fairly shone with white and yellow daisies and the red roses climbing in profusion over the casement mingled their perfume with the sweetly penetrating odor of the sea. It was a place to dawdle in, to lie and dream away a whole afternoon, watch the sleepy butterflies and listen to the chorus of birds which seemed to fill every corner of the sky. Indeed, I was already debating in my mind whether to linger and enjoy it all instead of taking the strenuous pathway over the hills when the old rustic in the settle opposite suddenly turned his face towards me and for the first time began to speak. His voice had a quiet, dreamy note in it that was quite in harmony with the day and the scene, but it sounded far away, I thought, almost as though it came to me from outside where the shadows were weaving their eternal tissue of dreams upon the garden floor. Moreover, there was no trace in it of the rough quality one might naturally have expected. And now, when I saw the full face of the speaker for the first time, I noted something like a start that the deep, gentle eyes seemed far more in keeping with the timbre of his voice than with the rough and very countrified experience, appearance of the clothes and manner. His voice set pleasant waves of sound in motion towards me, and the actual words, if I remember rightly, were, You're a stranger in these parts. Or, Is not this part of the country strange to you? There was no sir, nor any outward, invisible sign of the deference usually paid by real country folk to the town bred visitor but in its place a gentleness almost a sweetness of polite sympathy 
that was far more of a compliment than either. I answered that I was wandering on foot through a part of the country that was wholly new to me, and that I was surprised not to find a place of such idyllic loveliness marked upon my map. I've lived here all my life, he said with a sigh, and I am never tired of coming back to it again. <clears throat> then you no longer live in the immediate neighborhood. I have moved, he answered briefly, adding after a pause in which his eyes seemed to wander wistfully to the wealth of blossoms beyond the window. But I am almost sorry for... Nowhere else have I found the sunshine lie so warmly. The flowers smell so sweetly. Or the winds and streams make such tender music. His voice died away into a thin stream of sound that lost itself in the rustle of the rose leaves climbing in at the window. For he turned his head away from me as he spoke and looked out into the garden, but it was impossible to conceal my surprise, and I raised my eyes in frank astonishment on hearing so poetic an utterance from such a figure of a man, but at the same time realizing that it was not in the least inappropriate, and that in fact no other sort of expression could have properly been expected from him. I'm sure you are right. I answered at length when it was clear he had ceased speaking. Or there is something of enchantment here. Of real fairy-like enchantment. That makes me think the visions of childhood days. Before one knew anything of... of... Hmm. I'd been oddly drawn into his vein of speech. Some inner force compelling me. But here the spell passed and I could not catch the thoughts that I had a moment before... Opened a long vista before my inner vision. To tell you the truth, I concluded lamely, the place fascinates me, and I'm in two minds about going further. Even at this stage, I remember thinking it odd that I should be talking like this with a stranger whom I met in a country inn. For it has always been one of my failings that to strangers my manner is brief to surliness. It was as though we were figures meeting in a dream, speaking without sound, obeying laws not operative in the everyday working world, and about to play with a new scale of space and time, perhaps. But my astonishment passed quickly into an entirely different feeling when I became aware that the man opposite had turned his head from the window again and was regarding me with eyes so bright they seemed to almost shine with an inner flame. His gaze was fixed upon my face with an intense ardour, and his whole manner had suddenly become alert and concentrated. There was something about him now I felt for the first time that made little thrills of excitement run up and down my back. I met his look squarely, but with inward tremor. Stay then a little while longer. He said in a much lower and deeper voice than before. Stay. I will teach you something of the purpose of my coming. He stopped abruptly. I was conscious of a decided shiver. You <clears throat> have special purpose then in, uh, in coming back? I asked, hardly knowing what I was saying. To call away someone, he went on in the same thrilling voice. Someone who is not quite ready to come, but who is needed elsewhere for a worthier purpose. There was sadness in his manner that mystified me more than ever. You mean, I began with an unaccountable access of trembling, I have come for someone who must soon move, even as I have moved. He looked at me through and through with dreadfully piercing gaze, 
but I met his eyes with a full straight stare. Trembling though I was, and I was aware that something stirred within me that had never stirred before, though for the life of me, I could not have put a name on it or have analyzed its nature. Something lifted and rolled away. For one single second, I understood clearly that the past and the future exist actually side by side in one immense present. That it was I who moved to and fro among shifting protean appearances. The old man dropped his eyes from my face and the momentary glimpse of a mightier universe passed utterly away. Reason regained its sway over a dull, limited kingdom. Come tonight, I heard the old man say, come to me tonight into the wood of the dead. Come at midnight. Involuntarily, I clutched the arm of the settle for support, for I then felt that I was speaking with someone who knew more of the real things that are and will be than I could ever know while in the body, working through the ordinary channels of the sense. And this curious half-promise of a partial lifting of the veil had its undeniable effects upon me. The breeze from the sea had died away outside, and the blossoms were still. The yellow butterfly <clears throat> floated lazily past the window, and the... The song of the birds hushed. I smelt the sea. I smelt the perfume of a heated summer air rising from the fields and flowers. The ineffable sense of June and of the long days of the year and with it from countless green meadows beyond came the hum of myriad summer life, children's voices, sweet pipings and the sound of water falling. I knew myself to be on the threshold of a new order of experience, of an ecstasy. Something drew me forth with a sense of inexpressible yearning towards the being of this strange old man in the window seat. And for a moment, I knew what it was to taste a mighty and wonderful sensation, and to touch the highest pinnacle of joy I had ever known. It lasted for less than a second, and it was gone. Um, unfortunately. <laughs> but in that brief instance of time, the same terrible lucidity came to me that had already shown me how the great... <clears throat> how the past and future exist in the present, and I realized and understood that pleasure and pain are one and the same force, for the joy I just experienced included also all the pain I'd ever felt or ever could feel. If you're wondering, what is this guy talking about? A classic feature of old Victorian ghost stories is just <laughs> old Englishmen rambling <laughs> on pseudo-philosophical rants. It's like a key feature. There were some stories I cut because this was like 90% of them and then something cool would happen. Just gonna have a drink of water. GS says don't go with him into the wood of the dead. I don't see why not. Stranger told him to do it at midnight. Someone in a hostel told me to go to some forest in the middle of the night. Why wouldn't I? <clears throat> the sunshine grew to dazzling radiance faded and passed away the shadows paused in their dance upon the grass deepened a moment and then melted into air the flowers of the fruit trees laughed their little silvery laughter as the wind sighed over their radiant eyes the old old tale of its personal love once or twice a voice called my name a wonderful sensation of lightness and power began to steal over me and then suddenly the door opened and the innkeeper's daughter came in. 
By all ordinary standards, hers was a, a charming country loveliness, born of the stars and wild flowers, of moonlight shining through autumn mists upon the river and the fields. Yet by contrast with the higher order of beauty I had just momentarily been in touch with, she seemed almost ugly. How dull her eyes, how thin her voice, how vapid her smile, and insipid her whole presentment. Just ragging on this girl. <laughs> For no reason. For a moment she stood between me and the occupant of the window seat while I counted out the small change for my meal and for her services. But when an instant later she moved aside, I saw that the settle was empty and that there was no longer anyone in the room but our two selves. This discovery was no shock to me. Indeed, I had almost expected it. And the man had gone just as a figure goes out of a dream, causing no surprise and leaving me as part and parcel of the same dream without breaking of continuity. But as soon as I'd paid my bill and thus resumed in very practical fashion, the thread of normal consciousness, I turned to the girl and asked her if she knew the old man who'd been sitting in the window seat and what he'd meant by the wood of the dead. Well, the maiden started visibly glancing, uh, started visibly glancing quickly around the empty room, but answering simply that she had seen no one. I described him in great detail, and then as the description grew clearer, she turned a little pale under her pretty sunburn and said very gravely that it must have been a go ghost. Ghost? <clears throat> what ghost? Oh, the village ghost, she said quietly, coming closer to my chair with a little nervous movement of genuine alarm, adding in a lower voice, He comes before a death, they say. It was not difficult to induce the girl to talk, and the story she told me, shorn of the superstition that had obviously gathered with the years around the memory strangely picturesque figure was an interesting and peculiar one. The inn, she said, was originally a farmhouse occupied by a Yemen farmer, evidently of a superior or if rather eccentric character who had been very poor until he reached an old age when a son died suddenly in the colonies and left him an unexpected amount of money, almost a fortune. The old man thereupon altered no wit his simple manner of living, but devoted his income entirely to the improvement of the village and to the assistance of its inhabitants. He did this quite regardless of his personal likes and dislikes, as if one and all were absolutely alike to him. Objects of genuine and impersonal benevolence. People had always been a little afraid of the man, not understanding his eccentricities, but the simple force of this love for humanity changed all that in a very short space of time. Before he died, he became known as the father of the village and was held in great love and veneration by all. A short time before his end, however, he began to act queerly. He spent his money just as usefully and wisely, but the shock of sudden wealth after a life of poverty, people said, <clears throat> had unsettled his mind. What a Victorian thing to say. Don't want to let the poor get any money. They go mad with it. <coughs> he claimed to see things that others did not see, to hear voices and to have visions. Evidently, he was not of the harmless, foolish visionary order, but a man of character and of great personal force, for the people became divided in their opinions, and the vicar, good man, regarded and treated him as a special case. For many, his name and atmosphere became charged with almost a spiritual influence who was, that was not of the best. People quoted texts about him, kept when possible out of his way, and avoided his house after dark. None understood him. But though the majority loved him, an element of dread and mystery became associated with his name, chiefly owing to the ignorant gossip of the few. 
A grove of pine trees behind the farm. The girl pointed them out to me on the slope of the hill. He said was the wood of the dead. Because just before anyone died in the village, he saw them walk into that wood, singing. None who ever went in there came out again. He often mentioned the names to his wife, who usually published them to all the inhabitants within an hour of her husband's confidence. And it was found that the people he'd seen enter the wood died. On warm summer nights, he would sometimes take an old stick and wander out hatless under the pines, for he loved this wood and used to say he met all his old friends there and would one day walk in there never to return. His wife tried to break him gently off this habit, but he always had this his own way. And once when she followed and found him standing under a great pine in the thickest portion of the grove, talking earnestly to someone she could not see, he turned and rebuked her very gently, but in such a way that she never repeated the experiment, saying, You should never interrupt me, Mary, when I am talking with the others. For they teach me, remember wonderful things, and I must learn all I can before I go join them. The story went like wildfire through the village, increasing with every repetition until at length everyone was able to give an accurate description of the great veiled figures the woman declared she'd seen moving among the trees where her husband stood. The innocent pine grove now became positively haunted and the title wood of the dead clung naturally as if it were had been applied to it in the ordinary course of events by the compilers of the ordinance survey on the evening of his 19 90th birthday the old man went up to his wife and kissed her and his manner was loving and very gentle and there was something about him besides, she declared afterwards, that made him slightly in awe, her slightly in awe of him, and felt that he was almost more a spirit than a man. He kissed her tenderly on both cheeks, but his eyes seemed to look right through her as he spoke. Dearest wife, he said, I am saying goodbye to you. For I am now going into the wood of the dead, and I shall not return. Do not follow me, or send to search. But be ready soon to come upon the same journey yourself. Well, the good woman burst into tears and tried to hold him, but he easily slipped from her hands she was afraid to follow him. Slowly, she saw him cross the field in the sunshine and then enter the cool shadows of the grove where he disappeared from her sight. That same night, much later, she woke to find him lying peacefully by her side, in bed, with one arm stretched out towards her, dead. Her story was half believed and half doubted at the time, but in a very few years afterwards, it evidently became accepted by all the countryside. <clears throat> a funeral service was held to which the people flocked in great numbers and everyone approved of the sentiment, which led the widow to add the words, the father of the village after the usual text, which appeared upon the stone over his grave. This then was the story I pieced together of the village ghost as the little innkeeper's daughter told it to me that afternoon in the parlor of the inn. But you're not the first to say you've seen him, the girl concluded. And your description is just what we've always heard, and that window, they say, was where, was just where he used to sit and think, and think when he was alive. And sometimes they say to cry for hours together. And <clears throat> would you feel afraid if you had seen him, I asked the girl, for the girl seemed strangely moved and interested in the whole story. I think so, she answered timidly. Surely if he spoke to me. He did speak to you, didn't he, sir? She asked after a slight pause. He said <clears throat> he had come for someone. 
come for someone. Did he s say... She went on falteringly. N no, <clears throat> he did not say for whom. I said quickly, noticing the sudden shadow on her face and the tremulous voice. Are you really sure, sir? Oh, quite sure, I answered cheerfully. I didn't even ask him. The girl looked at me steadily for nearly a whole minute, as though there were many things she wished to tell me or to ask, but she said nothing, and presently picked up her tray from the table and walked slowly out of the room. Instead of keeping my original purpose, And pushing on to the next village over the hills, I ordered a room to be prepared for me at the end, and that afternoon I spent wandering about the fields, lying under the fruit trees, watching the white clouds sailing out over the sea. The wood of the dead I surveyed from a distance, but in the village I visited the stone erected to the memory of the father of the village, who was thus evidently no mythical personage. personage. And saw also the monuments of his fine, unselfish spirit. The schoolhouse he built, the library, the home for the aged poor, and the tiny hospital. That night, as the clock in the church tower was striking half past eleven, I stealthily left the inn, crept through the dark orchard, and over the hayfield, in the direction of the hill whose southern slope was clothed with the wood of the dead. genuine interest impelled me to the adventure, but I also was obliged to confess to a certain sinking in my heart as I stumbled along over the field in the darkness, for I was approaching what might prove to be the birthplace of a real country myth, and a spot already lifted by the imaginative thoughts of a considerable number of people into the region of the haunted and ill-omened. The inn lay below me, and all round it the village clustered in a soft black shadow unrelieved by a single light. The night was moonless, yet distinctly luminous, for the stars crowded the sky. The silence of deep slumber was everywhere, so still indeed that every time my foot kicked against a stone I thought the sound must be heard below in the village and waken sleepers. I climbed the hill slowly, thinking chiefly of the strange story of the noble old man who had seized the opportunity to do good to his fellows the moment it came his way, and wondering <clears throat> why the causes that operate ceaselessly behind human life did not always select such admirable instruments. Once or twice a, a night bird circled swiftly overhead but the bats had long gone since gone to rest and there was no other signs of life stirring then suddenly with a singular thrill of emotion I saw the first trees of the woods of the dead rise in front of me in a high black wall. Their crests stood up like giant spears against the starry sky, and though there was no perceptible movement of the air on my cheek, I heard a faint rushing sound among their branches as the night breeze passed to and fro over their countless little needles. A remote, hushed murmur rose overhead and died away again almost immediately, for in these trees the winds seemed to be never absolutely at rest, and on the calmest day there was always a sort of whispering music among their branches. 
For a moment, I hesitated on the edge of this dark wood and listened intently. Delicate perfumes of earth and bark stole out to meet me. Impenetrable darkness faced me. Only the consciousness that I was obeying an order strangely given including, and including a mighty privilege enabled me to find the courage to go forward and step in boldly under the trees of the woods of the dead. Instantly the shadows closed in upon me and something came forward to meet me from the center of the darkness. It would be easy enough to meet my imagination halfway with fact, but and say that a, a cold hand grasped my own and led me by invisible paths into the unknown depths of the grove, but at any rate, without stumbling and without the positive knowledge that I was going straight towards the desired object, I pressed on confidently and securely into the wood. So dark was it at first, not a single star beam pierced the roof of branches overhead. And as we moved forward side by side, the trees shifted slightly past us in long lines, row upon row, squadron upon squadron, like the units of a vast, soundless army. And at length, we came to a comparatively open space where the trees halted upon us for a while. And looking up, I saw the white river of the sky beginning to yield to the influence of a new light that now seemed spreading swiftly across the heavens. It is dawn coming, said the voice at my side that I certainly recognized, but which seemed almost like whispering from the trees. And we are now in the heart of the wood of the dead. We seated ourselves on a moss-covered boulder and waited the coming of the sun with marvelous swiftness, it seemed to me. The light in the east passed into the radiance of early morning. And when the wind awoke and began to whisper in the treetops, the first rays of the risen sun fell between the trunks and rested in a circle of gold at our feet. Now come with me, whispered my companion in the same deep voice, for time has no existence here, and that which I would show you is already there. We trod gently and silently over the soft pine needles. Already the sun was high over our heads, and the shadows of the trees coiled closely about their feet. The woods became denser again and occasionally passed through little open bits where we could smell the hot sunshine and the dry baked pine needles. Then presently we came to the edge of the grove, and I saw a hayfield lying in the blaze of day, and two horses basking lazily with switching tails in the shafts of a laden hay wagon. So complete and vivid was the sense of reality that I remember the grateful realization of the cool shade where we sat and looked out upon the hot world below. The last pitchfork had tossed up its fragrant burden, and the great horses were already straining in the shafts after the driver as he walked slowly in front with one hand upon their bridles. He was a stalwart fellow, a sunburned neck and hands. Then for the first time I noticed perched aloft upon the trembling throne of hay, the figure of a slim young girl could not see her face, but her brown hair escaped in disorder from a white sunbonnet, and her still browner hands held a well-worn hay rake. She was laughing, talking with the driver, and he, from time to time, cast up at her ardent glances of admiration, glances that won instant smiles and soft blushes in response the cart presently turned into the roadway that skirted the edge of the wood where we were sitting. And I watched the scene with intense interest, 
and became so much absorbed in it that I quite forgot the manifold strange steps by which I was permitted to become a spectator. Come down and walk with me, cried the young fellow, stopping a moment in front of the horses and opening wide his arms. Jump, I'll catch you. <laughs> she laughed. Her voice sounded to me as the happiest and merriest laughter I'd ever heard from a girl's throat. <laughs> That's all very well, but remember I'm the queen of the hay and I must ride. Then I must come and ride beside you, he cried, and began at once to climb up by way of the driver's seat. But with a peal of silvery laughter, she slipped down easily over the back of the hay to escape him, ran a little way along the road. I could see her quite clearly and noticed the charming natural grace of her movements and the loving expression in her eyes as she looked over her shoulder to make sure he was following. Evidently, she did not wish to escape for long, certainly not forever. In two strides, the big brown swain was after her, leaving the horse to do as they please. Another second, his arms would have caught the slender waist, but pressed the little body to his heart. But just at that instant, the old man uttered a peculiar cry. It was low and thrilling. And it went through me like a sharp sword. He had called her by her own name. And she had heard. For a second, she halted, glancing back with frightened eyes. Then with a brief cry of despair, the girl swerved aside and dived in swiftly among the shadows of the trees. But the young man saw the sudden movement and cried out to her passionately, Not that way, my love, not that way. It's the wood of the dead. She threw a laughing glance over her shoulder at him. The wind caught her hair and drew it out in a brown cloud under the sun, but the next minute she was close beside me, lying on the breast of my companion. And I was certain I heard the words repeated, they uttered with many sighs. Father, you called me and I've come. And I come willingly for I am very, very tired. At any rate, so the words sounded to me and mingled with them I seemed to catch the answer in that deep, thrilling whisper I already knew. And you shall sleep, my child, sleep for a long, long time until it is time for you to begin the journey again. In that brief second of time, I'd recognized the face and voice of the innkeeper's daughter, but the next minute, a dreadful wail broke from the lips of the young man, and the sky grew suddenly as dark as night, and the wind rose and began to toss the branches about us, and the whole scene was <clears throat> swallowed up in a wave utter blackness. Again the chill fingers seemed to seize my hand, and I was guided by the way I had come to the edge of the wood, and crossing the hay field, still slumbering in the starlight, I crept back to the inn and went to bed. A year later, I happened to be in the same part of the country, and the memory of the strange summer vision returned to me with the added softness of distance. So I went to the old village and had tea under the same orchard trees at the same inn. But the little maid of the inn did not show her face, and I took occasion to inquire of her father as to her welfare and her whereabouts. <laughs> Married, no doubt, I laughed, but with a strange feeling that clutched my heart. No, sir, he replied, the innkeeper sadly. Not married, though she was just going to be, but dead. She got sunstroke in the hayfields just a few days after you were here, if I remember rightly. She was gone from us in less than a week. And that is Eldernon Blackwoods. The Wood of the Dead. 
Jess says this is so beautifully written, but so tragic. Yeah, like, it's a ghost story. I think it suits Halloween, but it's certainly not like Lovecraftian horror and terror and I almost died and things are dying in that kind of way. It's sort of a, a beautiful vision of the afterlife. And in that way, I think it really stuck to me. Um, well, let's, uh, let's, let's get our fireplace back up here. <clears throat> um, Gia says that was a shocker ending. Yeah, you know, credit to him because I don't know about anybody else, but a hundred percent, I was like, oh, this dude's going to die. He came for that dude. Good work, Algernon Blackwood, for misguiding all of us. I do find it interesting that it definitely seems like she knew. She knew he was there for her, but it wasn't clear why. <clears throat> she just sort of understood that was who she was, he was there for. All right. Well, I like I said, a little bit longer. It wasn't quite as long as I feared. Uh, we're at an hour 20, and normally we're done at an hour. I was afraid we were going to be like an hour and 35 it's not a short story. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed those. Uh, if you did enjoy those and you're able to, uh, there are some costs that you can offset by buying me a coffee or two uh, down at the donation link below. But you don't have to do that. The thing I enjoy the most is telling stories to people. Uh, so if you, the probably the best thing that you could do for me, even more than that, is uh, if you think somebody would enjoy this, tell them about it. That is hands down the, the best thing you can do for like small little YouTube channels like this. Also, if you haven't already, consider subscribing. Even if you don't like everything we do, it lets you know when I have a video go up. And if it's something you like, you won't miss it. Um, and give it a like. Uh, that helps the algorithm know that you're engaged. Because uh, the algorithm is a cruel mistress. There's the real horror story, the algorithm. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, uh, you know, we had a, a, a big gust of popularity with Fireside Fairy Tales last week. Nothing big in YouTube terms, but huge for me. And for everybody who, who was a part of that and the people who put kind comments and liked that video uh, are by far the best performing video, The Demons of the Sea. Um, I just want to say thank you very much. I really, really, uh, it was a really good feeling, you know, uh, after doing this uh, for a while to know that for sure some people enjoy this uh, strange little thing I'm doing that is contrary to everything they tell you about youtube which is you're supposed to chase trends and uh this is true you're supposed to chase trends and you're supposed to like make content modeled around the current meta and that's like i like video games and i like gaming by the way i do a lot of tabletop but that's not really what i wanted to make videos of and that's the main thing if you want to get clicks um right now on youtube so i'm against every possible advantage so whenever people come by and enjoy my stuff and, and you know drop a little comment and a like and stuff like that uh it means the most to me <laughs> um of anything that you can do uh, so thank you everybody who did that and made that video such a success um hopefully if you came from this video that video that you enjoyed this one too i am actually even though there isn't another tuesday before halloween i think i am gonna pre-record one more short little story and put it out on halloween night so it won't be live but um, I found a good one about a werewolf that I don't know where else I would fit it. I'm also pondering, given the overall success of sort of horror and weird fiction, um, doing a once a month horror and weird fiction. Because once we leave Halloween, we go to like Christmas tales and folk, fo still folk stuff. To be honest, some of the folk tales are basically horror stories with a cheerful smile, but they're still like at their heart, pretty horrifying. Um, but I might still uh, break up our usual sort of straight run of stuff and once a week do like a weird fiction week or once a month do a weird fiction week. So if you guys uh, wanna hang around and see that, let me know. If you're like, please never do that. Also let me know. <laughs> I don't know what you guys want, right? Um, Thank you so much, GS, for keeping me company. Uh, thank you for everybody who hung out tonight. I will keep the fire warm. I hope you have a good sleep. And uh, don't follow strange men at midnight into the woods of the dead.